The Muslim Brotherhood was founded as a social, religious, and the political movement as a reaction to the Western influence in the Middle East and the Arab world. It happened in the beginning of the 20th century in 1928, and it was founded by Hassan Banna, who was a very important Muslim scholar, and um, this was the first basic foundation. So, Muslim Brotherhood is in fact an organization that was founded as a reaction to the Western influence in the Middle East. I was given the opportunity that if I promised not to deal with the Middle East, not to deal with Iran, not to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood, but deal with the history of anti-Semitism, I would be able to stay at Yale and run the center. And the person who told me this was the person who brought me to Yale. And at that meeting, I stood up, I shook his hand, and I thanked him very much for bringing me to Yale. But I said that I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I was taking a paycheck to deal with anti-Semitism from a historical perspective only, and that my colleagues and I would be banned, banned at a university to deal with relevant issues uh, and a relevant subject matter. So I left. So the first part is to actually have the other. We talked about this, people outside of the lens, whether they're Muslim, Jewish, whatever they are, are not part of the gang. The second is the collectivization, that everybody outside of the lens is the same. The third part is the oppression narrative, that everyone is oppressing them, especially people who are Jewish. The fourth part is that even if they're not being oppressed by certain people, by the very fact that they're not part of the gang, they're complicit. And five, the supremacism narrative. And then we get the tipping over to violence, the self-defense narrative, and violence is the only way. So the reality is that anti-Semitism has greatly increased in the United States. Um, the um, Anti-Defamation League, which keeps track of these things, found that white supremacist propaganda hit an all-time high in 2020. It was a 68% increase just from 2019. So what you're seeing is a real dramatic escalation. And when specifically asked about the central purpose of 9-11, it was Osama bin Laden who replied, and I quote, to force America to end its support for Israel. His unambiguously stated aim to destroy Israel was inextricable from his contempt for the United States, the world's largest home to diasporic Jews a majority of whom live in New York. One of the hashtags that we saw surging with this campaign was COVID-1948, put out over close to 200 times per minute. COVID-1948 began trending on Twitter. The idea that the, that the Jewish state was a, a colonial virus that was seeking to replace dark-skinned people and take them over and infect them along with genocidal um, uh, depictions again, by self-identified Iranian accounts. In fact, most of this was by self-identified Iranian accounts. Our analysis showed that those accounts were created in the same month and in the same year, and that there were many of them. Schools around Europe, as we found when we're doing this work, are guarded by security guards and with barbed wire and with security fences. In Turkey, it's not only guarded in that way, there is, a, there is a school bus that every day changes its code. The code is changed and the school bus has to flash that code in order to get in and there are bulletproof windows in the building. Now, yes, children are being educated, but Jews are being singled out that they need these security measures because the state can't protect them against anti-Semitism. And that itself is a violation if they want to go to a Jewish school, a violation to some extent of the right to education. And then I reached out to uh, you know Jewish communities because I wanted to be able to do a report that made sense to Jewish communities in terms of in terms of your understanding of where the, what the concerns were and also what your understanding of what can be done by the UN. Fully mindful of the very toxic nature of the UN system in dealing uh, with issues linked uh, with Israel or with Jews in, in general. And of course, you know the UN system. Um, while I would not say it's anti-Semitic, is very hostile to Israel and therefore hostile uh, towards th things to with, with, I think, Jewish communities. And, and of course, you know, um, the whole subject of anti-Semitism, although dealt previously by the reporter on, on racism, um, was then ignored, but also 
by states directing that person to write in certain way, meaning focusing on Europe and neo-Nazism, was in my, in my view really uh, putting a screen on the very, very, if you like, you know, uh, complex nature of anti-Semitism. As Rosa mentioned, it was everywhere. I would in fact say it's not just radical Islam. I think Islam in, in very large, in very large part of the Muslim world, not just everybody who can be labeled radical Muslim, is exposed to anti-Semitic discourse in schools and elsewhere. The end result is that Jews are becoming stigmatized everywhere, regardless of their view on Israel. And this results in increased anti-Semitism. And the other piece of this is that the delegitimization of Israel succeeded in mainstreaming uh, desensitization uh, of the West to anti-Semitism. And uh, just to explain what I'm talking about, after the last operation, uh, this is the scene from London, as most of you are familiar with, um, clearly uh, 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 anti-Semitism, clearly against Jews, wherever they were. Uh, and the desensitization, uh, I think we can summarize in this cartoon published in the New York Times, which its own editorial board said is absolutely anti-Semitic. So we had a process here of demonizing and delegitimizing, creating a situation um, that led to anti-Semitism.